Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome back to New Books in the American West, a channel on the New Books Network of podcasts. I am your host, Stephen Hausman, and today I'm speaking with John Briscoe, a lawyer and an author many times over, who is currently a distinguished fellow at the C Institute at the University of California at, Book- at Berkeley, and we'll be discussing his new book, Crush, The Triumph of California Wine, which came out with the University of Nav- Nevada Press in 2018. Thank you so much for joining me today, John. It's good to have you. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. On the New Books Network, we always like to begin by hearing a little bit about the author. So let's just start by hearing a bit about you. What is your background and how did you become interested in history and California history in particular? Well, I may have become history interested in history because um, I never had a professor like you in, in history for a teacher like you in high school um, or college, it was the usual, here are 397 dates, memorize them, they'll be on the final exam, uh, see you then. Uh, uh, that's a gross exaggeration. I had very tough history teachers who occasionally, occasionally lifted the veil the veil that hides the fact that history can be very, very fun. And it was just enough to make me interested in history. I didn't major in history. I took a lot of history uh, when I was in college. Uh, And various aspects of history uh, made me interested. uh, When I was, um, well, many, many years ago, I read about the death of a Berkeley professor named um, Arthur Quinn. He was the chairman of the Department of Rhetoric, like most Berkeley professors, I'm not counting myself. Uh, He was a genius. I looked at the books that he wrote and virtually none of them was about rhetoric. They were about history. And he would find some little niche in American history or California history that fascinated him. And then I thought, well, there's, you know, I've got that same ailment, that same (laughs) problem. And once he got tenure, I later learned that then he was free to write whatever the heck he wanted. He had to get that university press published book in his field. And I've been writing about things that interest me. Uh, Some of them may border on the frivolous, like the history of the California wine industry. What is so important about that? Answer, nothing, Uh, but you might find it interesting. And I've also written about uh, the history of the nuclear age uh, and out here in uh, California, I'm in San Francisco, um, the horrible history of the treatment of the uh, native Californian where 95% um, were killed. Uh, There was a genocide, and one of your uh, history brethren at UCLA, Benjamin Madley, who's a good friend of mine, wrote a fabulous book called An An American Genocide, which blew the lid off of that, and I have written follow-up articles. So, sublime to the ridiculous, I've written a a gastronomic history of San Francisco and a history of wine in California, and there are these things that you get, I'm sure you know the feeling, why am I wasting my time on this? But it's interesting. It's interesting. And oh, I see a story here and I've just Mm -hmm. got to tell it. And then there comes a point where it's sort of like you've half painted the bathroom. You've got to finish it. Mm -hmm. And, and as we were emailing a bit about this as well, and that, you know, we're talking here about your book crush, but that's not even your most recent book that you're a pretty prolific author yourself. You, you, and not only do you cover a lot of topics, but you, you've just written quite a few books too, which was very impressive to me as someone that's struggling to get through one single book right now, as far as writing goes. (laughs) Yes. And it's just, uh, you're absolutely right. My latest one came out two weeks ago, a book of poetry, uh, two years before that, came a child's Christmas in San Francisco, which has almost nothing to do with Christmas. It's not religious at all. It's about food and drink, if you can believe that. Um, Translations from the ancient Chinese in 2016 and so forth. Yeah, just all all over the ballpark. 
wherever my wandering mind <laughs> takes me. Well, I'm wondering then what brought, as you put it, your wandering mind to the history in this book? Um, what's your relationship with wine and what made you want to write a book about the history of wine in California specifically? It started out as a chapter in a book I wrote that came out 20 years ago, um, right about now, uh, that was a history of restaurants in San Francisco. Now, why would that be of any interest to anybody? Well, when I was growing up, I was raised by my grandmother uh, in San Francisco, in North Beach, which is the little Italy of San Francisco. Uh, but in those immediate post-war years, uh, Chinese had moved, Chinese families had moved across Broadway, which was a long uh, maintained, uh, it's a very broad street. Uh, <clears throat> not barrier actually, but uh, the Northern boundary of Chinatown. And they began living in North Beach and right across from the little place where we lived, that little apartment we boarded with a woman, was the North Beach playground. And all the kids there were Italian or Chinese. And of course, I thought that all people on earth were Italian or Chinese. And my grandmother, who was a Yaqui woman from Mexico, had a heck of a time telling me, no, you're not, you're neither Chinese nor Italian. <clears throat> but we would go out to eat and then I would see my father on occasion and he would take us to restaurants and he would tell us, tell me uh, the history of restaurants in San Francisco. And these were, he was a fabulous storyteller as was his mother, my grandmother. Um, and he had actually worked as a busboy. He wanted to become a chef. He signed on as an apprentice chef on a, a luxury liner. And in those days that there weren't culinary institutes per se, in France, yes, but not here. Uh, that's what he really wanted to do, and he never lived to fulfill that. Well, he died when I was a boy, uh, a few years after that. But I, I kept those stories in mind, and I had a law partner who lived in England, whose first language was French. And I would visit him. I have two kids, two grown kids, 41 and 39. As a matter of fact, it's my daughter's birthday today, and I've got to remember to call her. <laughs> um, and, and I would take my kids to England, and we'd visit with my law partner's uh, family and his kids and grandkids and so forth. And he grew up speaking French uh, first, and he had a whole small room that was a, a French library. So, all the books were in French. And here was a multi-volume work. It looked like the Oxford English Dictionary uh, by Alexandre Dumas. And I thought, well, I know of the Count of Monte Cristo and the Three Musketeers and the 260, count them, other novels that he ostensibly wrote, but I never he heard of Le Grand Dictionnaire de Cuisine. So I pulled down volume one and I had three years of high school French <clears throat> and if you had any high school French you know what I'm talking about you go to France you're lost because you really didn't learn how to speak it but you can with a dictionary you can kind of make your way through the written French word and I'm thumbing through and thumbing through and I see the words San Francisco which I later learned are the same in French as they are in English and what he wrote was after Paris the greatest restaurant city in the world is San Francisco. Now that hit me like a thunderbolt because San Francisco wasn't really born until 1849. New York was 1624, Boston was 1630. Those towns are 200 years older. When could this book have been written at the very latest? When could those words have been written? Remember, this is an encyclopedia. The greatest work on food ever written <clears throat> not later than 1869 because Dumas died in early 1870 so here's a Frenchman a Parisian saying the second greatest restaurant city in the world is someplace in California there is no Panama Canal there is no transcontinental railroad there is no way he apparently never went there its reputation was so great that he wrote that 
I mean, the French were pretty haughty about everything, particularly their food, even then. That's high I praise, that's, exactly, right. <laughs> it, it's just outrageous. Yeah. Second greatest in the... <clears throat> well, I began to dig when I got home. And I, I thought to myself, well, there's more to this story than I thought. I dug into it. And it's a fascinating story. San Francisco in 1847 had a population of 442 people. They did a census. They also counted the dogs because there was so little to do, the census takers, right? By the end of 1849, the gold rush was in 1849. And I, I could bore you to tears about the gold rush, but from that population of fewer than 500 people, the leading citizen was a freed black slave from the Danish West Indies, which is now the American Virgin Islands. <clears throat> The population swelled to something like 50,000, from fewer than 500 to 50,000 people in a year. Boom. Now, who are these people? Well, <laughs> they're mainly men. Uh, they know how to drink, curse, fight, steal. I mean, these are not the cream of the civilization, the male civilization of anywhere. And they came from all over the world. They didn't know how to cook. A very enterprising French businessman in San Francisco, as soon as the gold rush began, he knew. And he went to his homeland and brought back 50, uh, pardon me, 40 classically trained French chefs. Now, why was it easy to lure them to California? The second French Revolution had just happened. Their employers, the aristocrats, had lost their heads, literally. So they came and they immediately infused uh, San Francisco food. Restaurants popped up everywhere. They immediately infused San Francisco food. I've used that verb accidentally, but I sh should have used it intentionally because today we speak of fusion. So what do we have here? We had fresh fish, seafood. Um, eggs were a long time coming. Uh, the game of all sorts of uh, uh, ducks, geese, pheasant, turkey, on and on and on. And these fellows had gotten used to how delicious they taste when freshly slaughtered and cooked. The French chefs came with their sauces. The sauces were developed because there was no refrigeration in France and the seafood and the meat <laughs> tasted pretty awful. So you drowned it in sauce. So the chefs, in order to keep their customers, had to really cut back on their use of sauces. That's how it's, it all began. To this day, San Francisco has, um, of the five oldest restaurants in the United States, three are in San Francisco. And again, we're 225 years younger than New York, almost that much younger than Boston. I could go on and on with Philadelphia and Charleston and so forth. New York City does not have a restaurant older than Sam's Grill, which I own, I co-own with a, a group of friends. Uh, why did we get into it? Because we're fools and because we love history and the darn thing was going to go the way of all flesh. So, <clears throat> so I started writing this book and then I realized, it, you know, if in a period of 20 years from 1849 to 1869, San Francisco became the second greatest food city in the world in the mind of the most knowledgeable food writer, apparently, that ever lived. You know those 260 novels of Duma I mentioned? He didn't write them. He had ghost writers write them. Once he had a bastard son, Duma Fies, and once father and son met, understood the son is now grown. <clears throat> And when he was growing up, father and son would take little, we would call them bonding trips, you know, to Prague or Moscow to visit the brothels in those towns. They were, they were very close. So son grows up and becomes a playwright. Father and son meet on the streets of Paris. They embrace. And father says to son, Dumas Fils, have you read my latest book yet? And the son says, 
no father have you that's how well known it was <laughs> but what the dad did write was this encyclopedia of cuisine so i was astonished at how in a mere 20 years san francisco attained that food reputation and to this day, it has a pretty good food reputation. I wouldn't say it's the second best in the world by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, <clears throat> I'm no judge of that. Uh, but then I began to reflect on California wine. And I was struck by the fact that the story of California wine, uh, many people, there was a movie made about it. Uh, remember that in 1976, there was a blind tasting in Paris put on by an English wine merchant who just died named Stephen Spurrier, uh, no relation to the football coach of the same name in, in America, uh, in which California wines, there's blind, completely blind tasting that eight judges are all French. They're just the top of the top of the line. Odette Kahn, uh, Raymond Oliver, big, big names. The California wines beat the French in a blind tasting. And, but I knew that wines had been planted way back as early as 1770, that grapes had been planted here with the idea not of providing table grapes, but of making wine. Why did it take so long? It seemed to me it was the opposite story. It just took forever and ever and ever. So it started out as a chapter in a book, a very um, tough, <laughs> but, but uh, right thinking <clears throat> editor said, that isn't the chapter in this book about San Francisco cuisine. That's, a, that's something else. So it ended up on the cutting room floor, but I didn't throw it away. And the first thing you know, I was <laughs> at work making a book out of it. And that's, that's usually how these projects go, right? Is you'll start one project while you're researching and writing, you'll come across something else that just kind of sticks in your mind, or in this case, you write a whole chapter about, and next thing you know, you've you know planted the seed, so to speak, of, of your next project. So it's, it's, a feel, right. it's, it's a story that I hear a lot on this show, honestly. I'll bet. Yeah. So you touched on this a bit, but as we get into the narrative, the story that you tell in this book, let's go all the way back to the beginning of this history. What is the history of wine in North America? And of course, specifically, what's the history of wine in California? The earliest grapes planted, the earliest glasses of wine that someone was drinking in, in, in California. Who was making it? Who was drinking it? And what did these wines taste like? Do you have any idea? I don't know that the earliest wines were made in the southeast and they weren't particularly good i mean the, the wine industry simply didn't take off that's all i can say i mean even today uh, you and i were chatting before the show about uh, uh i mean know something about california wine but i don't know diddly about wine in the sense of am i drinking a world-class cabernet or am i drinking plonk well, you're, probably... you're a historian, not a sommelier, essentially. Yeah, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> it's a good way to put it. Somebody says, well, put the glass to your nose. And I say, well, I can't smell anything. So why, why put the glass to my nose? Uh, but nothing much happened from those early days. I do touch on them, early days on the East Coast of America. Uh, there is a, a, a towering figure in the history of American wine, and his name is Thomas Pinney, who um, interestingly is an English professor uh, at, I believe, Occidental College, but one of uh, a liberal arts school in Southern California. He doesn't teach history, he doesn't teach wine history, and his field is uh, the Romantic period in English literature. And he's written a two volume, thoroughly, thoroughly uh, sourced book on the history of American wine. The history of wine in California really begins with the missions. And when, when I say the missions, I'm, I'm too accustomed to speaking to a California audience and they kind of know what I'm talking about. So let me explain. Our history books are, are wonderful. You know, they, they say, you know, <clears throat> Balboa discovered the Pacific Ocean. John Keats thought it was Cortez, of course, in his famous poem, but 
um, those those Incas, you know, who were staring at the belt at the Pacific Ocean for a long time, they were astonished to find out it was some guy named Balboa who discovered it. Uh, here in California, we read as children that um, a man named Cabrillo in 1542 discovered California when he sailed into San Francisco Bay. He claimed it for uh, the King of Spain, who did nothing about this phenomenal place that had just been claimed for him by one of his navigators. And it's, you know, on reflection, when you think of how tiny Spain is, Spain has a population, I don't know, 50 million people today. Maybe it had a population of 20 million then. It claimed most of Latin America, except for Brazil, uh, all of Central America, the Philippines, Guam, uh, and many of the islands in the Caribbean, and now they're claiming California. How can you possibly govern? I mean, what, what, what do you do? with all of this land. So they had it, 1579, Sir Francis Drake lands in Northern California. He wasn't Sir Francis Drake yet. He was just an ordinary pirate. I mean, he's just a no good ocean going pirate, a criminal. But he was Queen Elizabeth's pirate. And when he bought, brought back all that gold that he stole from the Spaniards who had stolen it from the Philippines, uh, why she made him a knight. He claimed all of this for uh, Queen Elizabeth. But again, England didn't settle the place. And then there were rumblings that the Russians were coming. So Spain thought, well, we better do something about it. And I believe you teach at a Jesuit school. Is that right, Steve? Um, not Jesuit, but a Catholic affiliated school. Yes, University oh, I, of St. Thomas. I, I, yes, yes. I thought it, I thought it was, oh, yes, right, right. Uh, uh, well, there are many Jesuit schools. The Jesuits were the spiritual arm of the King of Spain. And they had been sent to the New World to establish missions, to convert the native people, however, <laughs> by whatever means. Uh, but in 1769, the Jesuits got themselves in hot water with the king for reasons that are unclear to history. And the king said, you're out, and kicked the Jesuit order out of the new world and turned it over to the Franciscans and said to one particular uh, priest who was just made a saint, Sarah, I need you to establish a series of missions in this place called Alta California, what we call California. So he established in 1769, the first of 21 missions. They extend from San Diego, which is near the Mexican border, all the way to Sonoma, uh, which is north of San Francisco by 40 miles as the crow flies, maybe not even that. Um, and these were established over a period of about 50 years. It, it took a long time. Uh, he planted he and his padres, and they were accompanied by small garrisons of soldiers, they planted grapevines wherever they went with the idea that this was to be wine with meals and wine with the uh, Eucharist, the sacrament, the Roman Catholic sacrament uh, that is celebrated at mass. Uh, the grape that was planted was called the mission grape and people have figured out genetically what was it you know related to uh, grapes that we know now well i can tell you it's not related to any grape that is grown for wine producing reasons uh, i've tasted uh, wine made from that grape Pe people do have those vines mainly for historical interest and it wasn't particularly good but that's that really was the uh, inconsequential beginning of California wine. And it wasn't a, a business. I could find no record of uh, uh, the Franciscan priest selling wine. They would give it um, you know, to guests and give them uh, small barrels to take on their travels and so forth uh, because there, was, there weren't any distilleries and there weren't any breweries. And a lot of people who were traveling up and down California wanted 
<laughs> something to drink. So that's how it started. And these are these are very humble beginnings for California wine. Um, and like with so much else, like with seemingly every single story in California history, it's the gold rush of the late 1840s, which really changes everything. So yeah. these are the, the, you know, so to speak, deeper roots of California wine go back to the Spanish in the 18th century. But what you might call the more modern roots of California wine, as you explain in the book, really date back to the gold rush. So how how is this the case? How are, are these modern roots to be found in the rush and especially in the immediate aftermath of the gold rush in the 1850s? Well, first, I should mention that it's it's a curious historical fact, but commercial winemaking really began in Los Angeles. It did not begin in Northern California. And there was a man named Jean-Louis Vigne, V-I-G-N-E-S, which means literally vines or vineyards, who was from Bordeaux. He was trained as a cooper, but he knew how to make wine. He established uh, one of the early wineries in Los Angeles, right near the, uh, the big train station, Union Station in Los Angeles today. And it was apparently very, very good one. Uh, but over time, the climate in Los Angeles is very hot in the summertime. Uh, many other good wineries established there. Uh, but slowly and over time, wine took root in Northern California, particularly in Sonoma County. I mentioned that Sonoma is the home of the last mission, San Francisco de Solano, uh, in, in the, in the chain of missions. Um, but a man named uh, uh, General Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo, Vallejo is how people pronounce it here. There's a town called Vallejo. Um, he was uh, born the son of a Spanish soldier. Uh, he was born in Monterey, California. So he was born a Spaniard. Uh, in 1821, Mexico successfully had a revolution against it's the last of the Bolivarian revolutions. Uh, so he became a Mexican general, Viejo did. He's, he wasn't a general by this point. Um, uh, Mexicans in California during that very brief California period, 1821 to 1846, is breathtakingly short. This is the era of Ramona, the big land grants and the fiestas and the fandangos and all of that. You know, it was only 25 years. That's it. And then the Yankees came. Uh, so he became a Californio. The Mexicans in California preferred to call themselves Californios. And then he became an American. And he became a legislator in the future state. Uh, but he founded a winery. He knew a bit about winemaking. He employed a, a fellow who had been a trapper. Uh, named George Yount, Y-O-U-N-T. Uh, now this is in the 1830s and 40s, before the gold rush. Um, Yount and his buddy Wolfskill had traveled all across the United States trapping and carrying their furs until they could get to a trading post, sell them, move on. In Los Angeles, which is where they first arrived in California, Wolfskill met that Frenchman I mentioned earlier, Vigne, and said, I'm tired of this life of trapping. It's a lot of hard work. I want to settle down. He settled down, learned winemaking, opened his own winery, which was very successful. His buddy Yant made his way all the way to California, went to work for General Vallejo in Sonoma, and himself became a thorough Californian. Didn't matter your ethnicity, it's your living here, you speak Spanish, and uh, there were 150 different Indian dialects in California. Uh, there were approximately 370,000 Indians in California when Cabrillo landed in 1542, uh, diminished by 95% by the US census of 1880. So, that is beginning to happen. It's the gold rush that killed off the Indians. Murder, just pure and simple. Um, <clears throat> so Yacht learns this, learns winemaking from General Viejo in Sonoma. And Yacht has become a favorite of the Mexican governor of California, 
and gets himself a land grant. So this brief period, 1821 to 1946, is a period of uh, 600 valid, never mind the questionable ones, 600 valid large Mexican land grants. There were six prior ones by the Spanish government, but that just pales. You, they're rare when you find a somebody's property just derives from a Spanish land grant. That's really something because it's so rare. So it's mainly Mexican. Yacht gets a land grant in Napa and founds the first vineyard and winery in Napa. So the, the, the folks in the Napa Valley are never happy to learn that, no, 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 you weren't the first. <laughs> you, your cuttings came from Sonoma, and that's how you got started, by the largesse and the spiritual, the mental generosity of General Viejo, who taught George Yaunt everything he knew. So that's, that's how that happened. So by the time we get to the 1860s, so after the gold rush, um, by that point, the industry has pretty much entirely shifted north. And you describe in the book how this northern shift of the industry, how it has really important implications for both the quality and the variety of wines um, and for the California wine industry more generally. So who are some of the early characters in the sort of post uh, uh, gold rush 1850s, 1860s wine industry? And why does this movement north that you just described, why does that matter so much for the production of different kinds of wine and of a higher quality of wine? Well, there are many people I can talk about, but it, I probably should, should dwell a little bit on a very interesting character, Augustan Harasti, H-R-A-S-Z-T-H-Y. It's a, 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 a my tongue stumbles every time I try to pronounce his last name. And of course, I have no idea whether I'm pronouncing it correctly. He came from Hungary, called himself a count. I am Count Barasti, and at other times a colonel. I am Colonel Barasti. He came here to make wine. He came here during the gold rush, but he came here to make wine. That was his passion. <clears throat> Most of the smart people who came did not come to make gold. They came to engage in banking, to corner the market in nails, like Mr. Huntington of the railroad, the Central Pacific, Southern Pacific Railroad. Uh, they, they weren't gonna get on their hands and knees and dig for gold. That was for fools. They were gonna make money. Uh, Levi Strauss, he made tents. And then somebody asked them to make a pair of pants out of that marvelous canvas that he used for his tents, you know, <laughs> no idiot. I'm just, I'm gonna sell to the miners. This is a heck of a lot better way. So Horasti came here and he had his Hungarians uh, 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 appreciation for wine. He flubbed a, a couple of attempts. He even tried to grow wine grapes in San Francisco, but he ends up in Sonoma uh, a piece, and he bought a piece of property very near uh, the Vallejos. Uh, I can tell you many remarkable things about Harasti. He's called, by the way, the father of California wine. That's an official state of California proclamation in, in 1949. But you might say, you could say that about Jean-Louis Vigne, the Frenchman I mentioned earlier, who settled in Los Angeles, who wrote uh, marvelous letters about how California could be a rival of France, even his home country as a wine producing region. People had this dream that this place could really make some of the finest wines in the world. Uh, Harasti had that dream. He talked the legislature of California into underwriting a trip to Europe. So Harasti goes to Europe and uh, comes back with hundreds of cuttings and the makings of a book. He wrote a quite good report to the legislature. Uh, he wrote about soil, about diseases. He even wrote about the infamous phylloxera. Uh, and, and he did a lot. He gets back to California, unfortunately, and he gets into a dispute with the legislature that doesn't want to, you know, it's just looking at his bill for this junket. And they decide not to pay him. In the meantime, Harasti's got these huge greenhouses with these thousands, really. I'm forgetting the, the number. I might have it here in my 
I can't find it. It would take too, too long to, to find. <clears throat> but thousands of cuttings that he's brought back aboard the, the ship that he sailed in. Um, <clears throat> again, no Panama Canal. This is a long, long, long trip to and from Europe. And in the greenhouses, the labels of the seedlings start to fall off. People will buy them, but they don't know what it is they're buying. One thing we do know that it was inventoried and a particular wine grape that for a hundred some odd years was thought to be uniquely California, Zinfandel. And everybody assumed that it must be Harassi. I mean, it even sounds Hungarian, Zinfandel, right? Harassi, Zinfandel. <laughs> It must have been one of the grapes that Harasti brought back. No, it's not on his inventory. Um, I have it. I have a copy of it uh, from the library at Berkeley. And I went through it to verify it myself. It's not there. Nothing that looks anywhere near it. Um, today, we know what it is. It's Primitivo, which comes from Italy. But it took you know DNA testing 20 years ago to figure that out. Uh, <clears throat> In any event, he really kickstarted everything. He founded a um, uh, cooperative is the best way to put it, the Buena Vista Viticultural Society. And it exists to this day as the Buena Vista Winery in Sonoma, the oldest winery in the state, 1857, uh, founded in uh, the fall of 1857. Coincidentally, the second oldest winery in California is Gundlach Bunshu, another mouthful, which is all of three miles down the road from Harasti's winery. So Harasti, I mean, when he arrived here, he was he was a character. He was elected a sheriff. Uh, he, he failed as a winemaker in San Francisco. I could have told him that. You can't grow grapes doesn't make wine in San Francisco. Look at the fog. He uh, got a job at the old Mint uh, at 608 Commercial Street and uh, very soon got indicted for, this is where gold uh, nuggets and whatnot were melted down into ingots, were made into coins. I mean, the the idea that all I need is just a few little things in my back pocket every day and then a couple of years I'll be rich and that's what he was accused of and it took him 15 years to settle those legal issues and then uh, toward the end he had money troubles he went to South America on a trip and it's reported one account that in trying to cross a river that was teeming with alligators. He was trying to go arm over arm on overhanging tree branches, slipped into the river and met his death at, uh, I guess it would be alligators there, uh, not crocodiles. My, when I was six years old, I knew the difference, but I'm not sure I do that. Anyway, this was one colorful life this fella had. And 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 this colorful life. This is the this is the, the the kind of modern roots of the California wine industry. And I really I like so much about that story of Harassi. And part of it is, it really underscores just how global of a story this is. That California, uh, you know, you, you might think the California wine is this like you know purely Californian story. And I mean, in some cases, I, I suppose that's true. But you really can't tell it without this larger global context between Zinfandel actually being an Italian varietal and and Harassi himself and all that. That just underscores how much this story is connected to so many other places in the world. Well, it is. I mean, there's no native California wine grape. Right. There are two native California grapes but they're not even good for eating and certainly not for making wine yeah i should i should say also the theme that emerged uh as i was writing the book was from the beginning there were people and they were all men today there are a lot of women winemakers and some of the best are women uh but there were all men at the beginning and there were many dreamers uh people who know anything about california wine will today we'll speak of Robert Mondavi, who was certainly a dreamer in that category. 
but there were dreamers before him, such as Jean-Louis Vigne. The, the, the priests don't fall into that category. You know, they weren't thinking about making grape wine. As, far, as near as I can tell, none of the diaries reveals any thought of that. Uh, but Jean-Louis Vigne and others, Kohler in the uh, 1870s and 80s, it was a fellow in San Francisco, uh, certainly harassed me. But <clears throat> then the wine industry experienced in rapid succession. I mean, if you ask the question, well, if they were dreaming that then, in the middle of the 18th, 19th century, and they beat the French in 1976, really put them on the map. What took so long? And it was a series of four really catastrophic setbacks. And the first one was a disease, a louse that attacks the roots of the, the grapevines. Uh, and it's called phylloxera. Now, curiously, the louse apparently originated where American winemaking first originated in the uh, Southern Atlantic states. Over in Europe, where they were having problems with this, that, and the other, they thought, well, we need new vigorous rootstock. So I'm now going back to 1800, that, that period. <clears throat> so they said, well, the new world, let's get rootstock from them, you know, wild grape rootstock. It hasn't been subjected to what we've got here in France. It's going to be very vigorous. They brought that over. Well, it had this louse and it began to ravage the vineyards of Italy, France, Germany, Hungary. Okay. But the louse was not here in California. But beginning in the 1870s, it began to destroy vineyards. By 1890, 90%, 90 some odd percent of the vineyards in Napa were destroyed. Every single wine growing region in the state has suffered catastrophic losses. Well, how'd the louse get here? Harasti's trip. He went to Europe, brought cuttings back from his trip to Europe, and those cuttings were infected with the, with the louse. So we exported from the North Carolina region to Europe, and then we bring it back to California. That's how the louse got here. And just when California wine is starting to to kind of, uh, uh, I mean, I keep using the same pun accidentally, but just starting to take root, basically, right? Like at this really yeah. prime period that you have this crisis that hits, right? When it seems like California wine is maybe just about to take off, like, as you said, you know, 70, 80% and more of some of the crops are lost. And as you mentioned a second ago, that's just one of basically successive crises that hit the industry over the course of the early 20th century. What happens next? Well, what happens next, um, first off, there were, other, there were other problems with the wine industry uh, at, at the time, false labeling, uh, a, lack of, um, a lack of consistency, uh, <clears throat> uh, all manner of problems. And some enterprising uh, vintners got together, Flaxer was the biggest crisis, and said, we got to do more. We've got to make sure the legislature funds research at the University of California, and it did. Um, uh, but we all, we should do something as, as a business entity. And so they formed a cooperative that was phenomenally successful, the California Wine Association. Um, <clears throat> it was founded in 1894, response to all these issues that I'm talking about. By 1900, it produced three quarters of all the wine produced in California. And it was run by an Englishman who was extremely savvy business-wise and kept all the members together. And we're gonna have one label, uh, Calwa, California Wine Association had a beautiful logo. Uh, we're gonna have different whites and different reds, but the customer, when they take, when they grab a bottle of claret, um, <clears throat> and this is where we just began expropriating words like uh, burgundy. Burgundy just meant red table wine. It did not mean a Pinot Noir wine from the Burgundy region in France, not at all. Um, Chablis, same, same thing. That just meant a generic 
house white wine, but they would taste the same. The quality would be uniform. You got what you were expecting from that last bottle or for you know, 10 years or so. So it built up, um, it owned blocks and blocks in San Francisco. It stored the wine here. Uh, it aged the wine. The, uh, and, and, and this began very, very rapidly. Uh, um, so you had cooperage. So you had whole industries devoted to, you know, lumbers being brought in and barrels are being made. You've got the iron foundries to make the hoops for the barrels and the barrels have no nails, but a lot of other things, pallets or whatnot need nails. Um, Glassworks, you gotta make bottles. Why not make the bottles right near where you're going to use them? Cork, um, sulfur for dusting the crops, okay? <clears throat> and so everything was localized in San Francisco. Uh, block after block, and these are huge city blocks. These are quarter of a mile long uh, in the south of Market Street area. And then on um, uh, April 18th, 1906, one of the biggest earthquakes in recorded history hit San Francisco. It's estimated it was an 8.3. Uh, the Fukushima earthquake of a few years ago was in Japan was a 9, 9.0. <clears throat> but it's it's um, very very tricky. A, a nine has one thousand times the power of a seven. You know, a nine point zero has a thousand times the power of a seven point zero. So you have this earthquake, but more devastatingly, the water mains were ruptured, and fires broke out. There were about a hundred separate fires that they've accounted for. And the firefighting people couldn't, couldn't uh, uh, extinguish them because they didn't have water pressure. And so uh, uh, about 70 some odd percent of all the structures in San Francisco were destroyed. Uh, uh, I'm not going to try to work the math out right here, but the population was 400,000 people at that time, roughly half of what it is today, okay? 400,000 people, 250,000 people were homeless within 48 hours, wandering the streets of San Francisco. And it's a tribute to the civic leaders of the day, uh, which did include the United States Army. There was a huge military garrison uh, at the Presidio of San Francisco. They were all housed and fed in, went back to ordinary lives in the fullness, fullness of time. It was a great, great response to that disaster. But three quarters of all the wine of California were lost, boom, just like that. So that was a huge setback. Fortunately, the California Wine Association, I haven't even talked about the other wineries. I'm just kind of focusing here on this one because it produced three quarters of all the wine in California at the time. It was well insured. It continued to pay dividends to its shareholders and it completely rebuilt a brand new facility on the uh, Richmond shoreline, not in San Francisco. Uh, and it was a company town called Winehaven and it was up and running in no time. Again, just really, really keen. I, I, I'm no business person. <laughs> I'm in awe of people who can see things in business and, and anticipate problems and everything else. But this, there was a remarkable recovery for this organization. Um, so once again, the California wine industry is on its heels. Um, up in Napa, there was extensive damage, but there were many, many great names. The, the greatest of them was Ingelnerk, which was founded by a Finnish fur trader of all things in the 19th century, Gustav Niebaum. And uh, he got interested in wine, just like you know, so many of the uh, uh, Roman aristocrats, when they retired from life, they, they moved to Bordeaux and they built themselves a, a winery and planted a vineyard. And, and that's, the, that's, that's the life I wanna leave now, live now. Uh, <clears throat> 
so that was the so the earthquake uh, was the second earthquake and fire fire really uh april 18th to april 22nd 1906 that was the second great catastrophe and then i want to focus on um Another catastrophe, which occurred, it's, it's, I guess we could call it a, a catastrophe of the US government's own making in the, the beginning decades of the 20th century. And that is, of course, the experiment of prohibition, uh, what I believe you call in the book, the failed experiment of prohibition. Um, you know, again, as you just said a second ago, that the California wine industry is on its heels after these crises. And then as of 1919, 1920, the 18th Amendment is passed and suddenly it is, it is you know, uh, an, an illegal industry in many ways, uh, essentially. So I guess my question is to turn this preamble into a question. How does the California wine industry weather the storm of prohibition? And who are some of the people after prohibition who rededicate themselves to raising the status of viticulture in California in the aftermath of prohibition's repeal in 1933? Yes, the, the, <clears throat> uh, the wine industry, just to answer one of your questions very succinctly, did not weather that storm very well. Um, it's, a, it's, it's fascinating to think, as a matter of American constitutional history, we amended the Constitution and then 14 years later repealed that amendment. And it was an amendment that has such a profound effect on so many aspects of American life. That's just mind boggling. Uh, how could the political machinery be created to get the amendment passed? And then how could it disintegrate so quickly, uh, the, you know, the answer to the former question is really intriguing for political scientists. It was a perfect storm, the dries. Those were the people who were in favor of banning all alcohol sales, uh, <clears throat> made uh, a pact with the women suffragettes. Women wanted the vote. Um, <clears throat> and they didn't have it, far and away, more women were in favor of prohibition than men. Aha, I see an alliance forming here, or a possible alliance. Um, but, there was, but there's a problem. How did the federal government <clears throat> finance itself then? Tax on alcohol. That was the biggest single source of federal income. The United States Constitution says, point blank, no tax on income. Well, there, there was a movement saying we need to have a tax on income to finance this growing federal government. So you see how these three interests merged. Um, and so the, the three amendments passed in rapid succession. <clears throat> but it was a miserable failure. Everybody who wanted to drink <laughs> somehow found out how to how to do it. Uh, MFK Fisher, uh, fabulous writer, I think her first book was How to Cook a Wolf, and in it she has a basically known for writing about book cuisine and uh, you know all of that. This is this is really basic stuff: how to make a sumptuous meal out of a can of spam. Okay, this, this sort of thing. She has a chapter on how to make vodka. You will guess what that's all about. <clears throat> and it's not quite as simple as you would think. There's a little art to it. And it's, you have your own vodka and it's very inexpensive and it just takes a trip to the hardware store. But you better get the right kind of alcohol or you're gonna be ghastly sick. Uh, <clears throat> it, it hit the wine industry particularly hard because wine drinkers, in America who liked drinking, uh, it, it, people weren't bootlegging wine. You know, in all the stories about bootleggers, you don't hear much about bootlegging wine. Wine is 12, 13% alcohol. Booze, whiskey, good old American rye whiskey, 40 to 50% alcohol, even higher if you want it. So if you're looking for that butt and you're worried about sh shipping, and being discreet about shipping, you're concerned about volume. So you invest in hard liquor. And that's 
mainly what happened. So the speakeasies didn't serve wine for the most, most part. So people who had been drinking wine lost their taste for wine during those 14 years. When uh, repeal happened in 1934, they didn't all of a sudden regain their taste for wine. They're used to a martini or a Manhattan. Now they can simply buy it legally, you know, the, the liquor legally, and they don't have to go through the rigmarole they, they used to. But also, it's, we're in the middle of the Depression. It is not as though it's a time of, you know, uh, great affluence in America. It's, it's in the heart of the Depression. So the wine industry really struggled. A few, a few wineries did very well, old ones. I mentioned Ingelnook before. Some say the greatest California wines ever, and they still exist in private cellars, and the owners will bring them out on special occasions for tastings, and you, you hear these, oh, it's just a screaming eagle can't hold a candle to this, you know, that's a $2,000 bottle of wine today. Um, but by and large, the, the wine industry was having a very difficult time uh, during that period. Then comes the war. So now you have rationing of all kinds of things. Uh, people don't have excess money to spend on wine. So the wine industry is just, is just taking it on the chin over and over again until after World War II. And we get back to work. And really, Eisenhower is elected president uh, seven years later uh, and is largely credited with you know keeping Khrushchev from the Soviet Union at bay and playing golf, which was his symbolic way of saying, America, we've all have just been through this horrible depression, this horrible World War II. And then we got dragged into that police action in Korea. Uh, just get back to work, raise your families, make some money. And it was during that period that um, um, Robert and Peter Mondavi brothers, um, they had grown up in Lodi, California, which is east of San Francisco, northeast of San Francisco. <clears throat> Their father had made wine, uh, had been in the produce business. They decided they, they wanted to get into winemaking. And the two sons went to Napa, to the Napa Valley, and bought one of the old wineries that had fallen on very, very hard times. Charles Krug, K-R-U-G. There you go again, a German influence you the Finnish fur trader you've got French um, Almadon uh, uh, influences from all over so they buy this winery and they begin producing quite good jug wine we would say today it's not going to win any contests um, but it's quite drinkable now the brothers were very, very competitive growing up. They uh, played football at Lodi High and at Stanford University. Um, they were combative. Peter just saw that, boy, we're making money hand over fist in the business as we've designed it. Robert, however, belonged to that class of people I was referring to earlier, the dreamers. We can make great wines in California, but we have to invest. Well, Robert started taking trips. He started investing in this and that. And it was a source of great struggle between the two, so much so that on a Friday afternoon, early evening in October, they were at their mother's house um, in Lodi, California, and they got into a fight. These guys are in their early 50s. They got into a fist fight. They end up on the ground. Robert's on top of Peter. He's got his hands around Peter's neck. And he's throttling him so much so that Peter had purple marks for, for weeks. And the mother, though I forgot the father had been killed in an auto accident a few years before the mother comes out screaming, separates the two, um, <clears throat> orders Robert out of, to, to leave the property. And then she and Peter fire Robert from uh, the, the family business, Charles Crew. Robert goes off, founds Robert Mondavi Winery within days with the help of some friends 
buys a piece of the old Ingleduck vineyard. And that's when finally the ascent began of California wine. Well, and as we start to get up toward the present day, I'm wondering what did Mondavi do that made that was so revolutionary in California wine? What is the story post Mondavi? I mean, in the book, you describe how in some ways he kind of began a wine revolution in California. And you see this explosion, this flourishing of the wine industry that will last up through the end of the 20th century. So what is the story after the founding of, of this new winery by Robert Mondavi after this, this Friday night fight that you described? <laughs> the Friday Friday night fight. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, it, 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 it launched the ascent of California wine that led to the judgment of Paris. So this is in 1976. So in 11 years, less than 11 years, that all happened. There was not a lot of fanfare. Here's, here's some guy kicked out of his family business and he buys 27 acres or whatever. But in 1969, he takes gold medal at the uh, Los Angeles County Fair which is a sign that he's striving for quality. His first winemaker was a man named Warren Winiarski, and he burns them out. And Warren goes off and starts working uh, as the winemaker at Stag's Leap, also in the Napa Valley. Second winemaker, uh, a Croatian uh, by the name of Mike Gergic, and he burns Gergic out after a bad 20 months. And Gergic goes off and becomes the winemaker at Chateau Montalena. Now, let's remember those two names. One of the other things Mandavi does is he, he founds a, an organization in the Napa Valley. He is spending his own money researching better ways to train the vines, uh, better rootstock, um, every single aspect of the production of wine, the growing of grapes, the production of wine, bottling, corking, you name it, he, his, his mind was consumed with doing it better. He brought over the best artisans from Europe in every one of these elements, and of course, brought in the best winemakers. And he was always heavily involved in, in, in the winemaking. What makes him, <clears throat> so what, there are a lot of people like that, but what he did, with the other Napa Valley growers and wine producers was he told them everything he learned. This, he didn't keep this knowledge to himself. He wanted it shared. He wanted everybody to be better. Now, in the meantime, he <clears throat> sues his mother and his brother for kicking him out of Charles crew. And that case winds its way through the tortuous California court system so that Trial began in April of 1976 in Napa. Robert Mondavi versus Rosa Mondavi and Peter Mondavi. It was in May that that blind tasting was held in Paris. And I mentioned earlier that American wines, California wines, Napa Valley wines beat all the French. And this was in the opinion of eight French judges, probably the best eight judges in France at the time. What were the American wines? Stag's Leap Cabernet, made by Warren Winiarski, who had been Mondavi's first winemaker. And the white was made, was a Chardonnay made by Mike Gergic at Chateau Montelaine. Well, is Mondavi around to celebrate this? Oh, he's in trial. He doesn't know for weeks what happened. July 4th, as a court holiday, as he did every day during trial, he went to visit his mother who's dying of pancreatic cancer. He knelt at her bedside and prayed for forgiveness, then went off to court to sue her, you know, to continue with this trial against his own mother. She dies on July 4th in the middle of trial. It goes on. Finally, in August, the judge rules after nearly three months of trial. That's a very, very long and grueling trial. That Robert was absolutely right that the others had defrauded him. Uh, so Robert got a very, very nice settlement out of that, which helped him financially. But unfortunately, he was not in Paris. He probably wouldn't have traveled uh, 
th there was not a heck of a lot of publicity going on about that wine tasting. It happened to be the proverbial slow news day. The bureau chief of Time Magazine, Tabor, you know, it's like, well, what do I do today? It's drifting through his papers. <laughs> well, the only thing in this whole city of Paris that seems to be going on is a blind tasting in this wine shop. Cave Madeleine. Madeleine is the name of the wine shop. So he went. If he hadn't have been there, nobody would have reported it. Those eight judges would have kept their mouths shut. They were shocked when they realized they had voted for California. <laughs> so Mandavi did that. It's an interesting sideline. So this all started October of 1965, as I mentioned, that fistfight. It may have been the exact same day, October 15th, 1965, was a Friday. I have not been able to pin down which Friday in October. I've gone through the whole court trial record, and there is no transcript because it wasn't appealed. And the court reporter discarded the notes. Uh, the living lawyers who were involved, uh, uh, I know... Uh, Robert Mondavi's lawyer. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Uh, uh, and he, <clears throat> John Martell is his name. He's an author. Uh, he, he doesn't remember his notes don't sh say anything, but uh, it was right around that time, within days, uh, that a guy named Fritz Maytag bought the last standing brewery in San Francisco, Anchor Brewing Company. And Fritz Maytag was to craft brewing in America, what Robert Mondavi was to wine. Because Fritz taught himself everything and he shared it with anybody. You talk to so many Lagunitas, um, Sierra Nevada brewery up in Chico, California. How'd they get their start? They paid a visit to Fritz Maytag and he told them everything they needed to know and he would always answer their phone calls and, and so forth. But anyway, that's what Mondavi did. He was dispersing all of his knowledge and, and whatnot. And of course, a phenomenal sense of goodwill throughout the Napa Valley. He, he was pretty centric to the Napa Valley. And to this day, his uh, protégés are out there everywhere. It's interesting to me that for someone that is competitive enough to sue his, his own brother and mother and to get into a fist fight in his 50s with his brother on the floor of his childhood home, that he would be also so generous with, with his knowledge. And you talking a second ago about um, uh, how all of these uh, winemakers who trained under Mondavi, how they went off to found their own wineries, it reminded me, I don't know if you're a football fan at all, but of the kind of coaching trees that you see where this coach had yes. these coaches working under him and they went on to do all these things. They trained these other coaches. It reminded me of something like that, where just one person who decided to, you know, not be too precious about the knowledge that he has was willing to, to basically put this industry on the map. It's, it's, it's quite a story. It is it's very, very generous. And there were other parallel stories. So Fred Frangio, who we talked a little bit about, Two Buck Chuck, as most of the world knew him, uh, who died very recently. Uh, he came along later, but he came from one of those old wine, winery families in the Central Valley of California uh, that uh, Frangio, I mean, it, it bears that name. Two Buck Chuck, the label reads uh, Charles Shaw. Um, so his story begins post-World War II. Now, Frangia was half a generation. I think he was 78 or 77 uh, when he died. Um, <clears throat> but the Gallows, Ernest and Julio Gallo, I mean, it's a phenomenal, quite scary uh, book uh, written about those two. Uh, and it's a very different uh, sort of story and now we're down to uh, there was the father and the mother who supposedly died of murder suicide and I'll just say there are substantial doubts that the husband killed the mother and um, th and then himself uh, right as uh, repeal is about to happen and so Ernest and Julio are 21 and 19, I think, and they, they take over the family business. And it's far and away the biggest wine producing entity in the world, uh, even to this day. And it's now down in successive generations. With Mandavi, uh, it's a, a terribly sad ending. I mean, it would take a, you know, Euripides or a Shakespeare to write it, but 
uh, after all of that success, he turns things over to his two sons who cannot agree. And a principal source of argument between them was the exact same thing that Robert and Peter quarreled about. Make a lot of money off of junk wine or do we strive for the very best? And in the end, the company fell apart and it's now owned by, uh, I don't know, the, you know, the Montgomery Wards of the world. What is it? Uh, Constellation or one of those. Or you know. InBev or one of those large sort of conglomerates of, uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, I think they make razor blades and tire rims <laughs> and uh <-huh. laughs> soap. <laughs> yeah. So as we begin to wrap up here, um, where does the wine industry in California stand today? What are some of the crises that it's facing? Does it stand on, on firm ground? And I know that you and I are both historians. We tend to look backwards. And at least I personally am always loath to make predictions about the future. But nonetheless, I'm curious, what do you foresee as the future of California wine? What should change? What needs to change? And maybe what shouldn't change at all? Well, it, I don't think that... The, there's anything in the offing nearly as dramatic as the 1976 judgment of Paris. And let me tell you, the headline writer, the person who wrote that headline for that <laughs> Time Magazine story deserves a special Pulitzer. I mean, that's just absolutely priceless. I don't know if you picked it up, but I, I had too much fun opening that chapter, trying to draw the parallels to the original story of the judgment of Paris and this blind tasting in Paris in 1976. It's just rich. There's not going to be anything like that, I doubt. And there will never be a um, proclaimed best wine region in the world. It's California. We're not, uh, you, we're not going to hear something dramatic like that. I think that California is going to continue uh, to produce great wines. Um, because I've met a lot of these people and their passion. Most, most of the people who are in the business today made their money something else, which is historically how it's happened. Uh, Rothschild, it was a banking family. Then they got into making wine. They bought some of the old, you know, great chateaus. <clears throat> and, but these people, Bill Harlan is a good friend of mine. He's got uh, Harlan Estate is his, you know, it's one of those cult wines. No way I can afford it. I like it when he offers me a, a small glass of his. A, a good friend to know, it sounds like. <laughs> well, a good, yeah, a good friend to know. And it, but and he was a very, very successful uh, real estate developer and country club developer and so forth. But he always had a passion for wine. And then he threw everything into it and he invests heavily. Um, I mean, every bunch of grapes has gone over by hand. If there's the tiniest little shriveled grape, out he goes. I mean, he's absolutely fastidious about every aspect of, of winemaking. And so it's, it's going to stay good. Um, my palate is not such that I could tell, tell you 20 years from now whether it's all gotten better or not. Uh, but I think it's going to stay good. I think that the two things are uh, the world's economy. Uh, if, if there's a global depression, uh, people just don't buy luxurious items. You, you, you're going to be buying used copies of uh, Mary Frances Kennedy Fisher's How to Cook a Wolf. And so let's see, just how do I make vodka? And how do I make a can of Spam serve a you know, an, an, an entire meal here. Uh, it's it, fine wine is something, if you're talking about fine wine, fine wine is something people enjoy when they have a certain degree of affluence. And then you got to get there, you got to pay your rent and put shoes on your kids' feet and all that sort of stuff first. Then you start thinking about what do you do with this little extra money that's burning a hole in my pocket. Uh, the other, of course, is climate change. Well, what does that mean? Uh, nobody knows. This is the short answer. And in one of my other lives as, as a lawyer, an international lawyer, I've done a lot of work for the United Nations. And um, 
my, to my friends, and there are many of them, and they're uh, oceanography professors, say, at uh, uh, Scripps or Santa Cruz, uh, UC Santa Cruz here, and they will speak of uh, climate change and global warming as the great existential threat. If I see that word existential one more time, affixed to, you know, it is the existential threat. No, it's not. No, it isn't. It's nuclear war, uh, nuclear world war three. And I'm saying it and saying it and saying it. And I've got one of these books that's three quarters finished. <clears throat> Why have we forgotten all about, well, <clears throat> the, the threat of nuclear war? I have my theory. It's too long for your, your listeners here, but. Um, that also think... would not be great for California wine for the record also. <laughs> Now, no, <laughs> it wouldn't. If you if you think that in 1962 we had the ability to, you know, it's it's, it's just about 60 years since the 13 days in October of 1962, <clears throat> we had the ability to destroy the world many, many, many times over, and we have a much greater ability to do that today, and to make it uninhabitable by humans for a very, very long time after that. Um, but my, I think my book is moot. My book was focusing on why on earth did we forget about the thing that concerned us the most? <clears throat> we totally forgot about it. Well, uh, you know, events in Ukraine have have made that book moot because now we are thinking about it. Uh, but if you know, if if that happens, all bets are off. Everything. Uh, it's just a matter of when does the cloud arrive, and people should watch. Read, read the book or watch uh, the movie On the Beach, which was based on a uh, Rand Corporation study. This is, this is how it ends. This is how it ends. And that was in the 50s. <laughs> it's, it's, only, it's only more risky now. Well, and for my, my last question, and you, you touched on this a little bit, um, and indeed at the outset, we talked about how you've written a couple books since this book was, was released, but I always am interested in getting a preview as to what my guests are working on next. And this book has been out for around four years now. Um, right. So what have, you, what have you done in, in the interim? And then what do you have next on the horizon? Are there any projects that you haven't mentioned that you're working on currently so we can get a bit of a preview on what's coming next? Sure. Well, I, I, I write poetry. Um, the book that was released two weeks ago, Strangers We Have Known, is a collection of uh, poetry, light verse, lyric verse. I also write light verse, and I write it quite seriously. <clears throat> um, one of the greatest poetry critics and editors in the, in the country, Joe Parisi, once told me, he said, it's, it's infinitely harder to write a good piece of light verse than it is to write a good piece of serious verse. So I have a, um, a book, I've, I've got to start chopping it to publishers called Fish Feathers. It's got uh, uh, super titles as opposed to a subtitle. Uh, I'm working on a book called uh, Paper Lawyer, um, which is really an examination of the rhetoric of law, whether it's judges or lawyers, you know, what's really going on when you read Dobbs versus uh, Jackson, uh, the, the case that overturned Roe versus Wade, what is, what's really going on? To, and trying to get it into plain English and you know teach people because rhetoric isn't taught I don't know is there a can you measure in rhetoric where, where you teach not in rhetoric specifically this is asking me to, to I'm mentally going through the course yeah, catalog, catalog. <laughs> there I, I know the English department offers uh uh like kind of majors it not short answer not to my knowledge but if yeah. any if one in the English department or communications at St. Thomas is listening and wants to send me an angry email please do do so because I, I don't have it memorized <laughs> Well, the only reason I mention that is that, that uh, you know, when you ask people, what are the liberal arts? And they rattle off things like history. Well, the original seven liberal arts did not include history, but the first three were the most important, uh, <clears throat> grammar, logic, rhetoric. And it was taught and Cicero mid-career took a sabbatical to 
study at the at the feet of the great master of rhetoric in the ancient world, uh, Apollonius Molon of of Rhodes. I mean, it was it's a it's a, a rigorous rigorous discipline. That's simply not taught. They used to have um, a department of rhetoric at, at Berkeley. I don't know if it still exists, but <clears throat> so that, that's it's called Paper Lawyer, which is a little pun on Paper Tiger, and also George Plimpton wrote. Um, paper lion about his trying out with the Detroit Lions football club in 1963. Brave guy. You know, he played football in high school and here he is 35 years old <laughs> and he gets walloped a few times by those defenses. So, um, and then a, um, and then a memoir, which is not about me. It's about people I've, I've met and known. And it's, uh, it's working title is life's a MacGuffin. And if you know what a MacGuffin is, I think you get it, so. John Briscoe is a lawyer and is an author many times over. Uh, he's currently a distinguished fellow at the C Institute at the University of California at Berkeley. And he is the author of Crush, the Triumph of California Wine, which we discussed today and which came out with the University of Nevada Press in 2018. Thank you so much for joining me today, John. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Steve. It has been a pleasure for me.